Uh, and our first speaker in this session is Dr. Christian Ryck, professor in psychiatry at Karolinska Institute here in Sweden and a practicing psychiatrist. He's the author of over 140 reviewed research articles and recently published the popular, pop, popular science book Olyckliga i paradiset, or in English, Unhappy in Paradise. Where in this book he takes us on a journey in the history of mental health and also discusses the expanding role of the psychi psychiatric diagnosis as a tool to interpret human suffering. Now, I read this book with much interest and I read, for example, from the book, what is the reason for diagnosis to have increased? Could one thing be that we've changed our view on what is to be acknowledged as a deceased has changed? A little bit of what you talked about also, Karen. Now, welcome, Dr. Christian Ryck. The screen is yours. Thank you very much for, for the kind introduction. So, and I'm very honored to be in such a, a distinguished panel. Uh, so, so the topic of my talk is, uh, is uh, about why mental health problems keep lingering on at the same degree in a country like Sweden. So, so I have a, in some way a little bit of a non-global perspective and outlook here, but I hope that the rest of the speakers will, uh, will make up for that. Um, so, um, well, m my take on what's going on is that, uh, for instance, in Sweden, I, I, th I, I'm, I'm, I really don't share the, the uh, view that you often hear in media that uh, some parts of the world have a tsunami of mental health issues going on. But, but I think for the majority of the population, we have stable levels of most psychiatric symptoms if you use the population surveys that we have in Sweden, for instance. Um, and, but, but the share of diagnosed and treated individuals uh, of the population is increasing. Clearly, the share of uh, sick leave diagnoses that are psychiatric has in Sweden reached, or reached almost 50%. And in man, many countries in the Western world, they are on the way up. So, so the, the proportion of health problems that, that are psychiatric seems to be increasing in many places in the world. Uh, the, the problems don't affect everyone at the same rate, but, but younger people seem more affected than women, more than men in general. Uh, so I guess the, the, the issue that I'm interested in here is that now, now that Sweden is uh, a country that has invested so much in health and, uh, and the factors that we think about as risk factors for psychiatric disorders, why, why are not the levels decreasing substantially of psychiatric problems? Um, so I, I will have some good news to share too, not, not, not to make the, you know, may make this too gloomy here. And I think there are some, or there are many, many good news here. And one is that we see that suicide is decreasing globally in almost all countries. Uh, it, it even decreased last year, where many people had a very negative outlook on mental health due to the pandemic. Um, I, I would say that in general, we have reasonably good treatment results for most psychiatric disorders. It's certainly not perfect, but it's also not um, really bad. Um, we even can see some population level effects on ADHD, for instance, on ADHD medication that violent crime, car accidents decrease due to treatment. It's, it's unusual in our field to show population effects, but there are some signs of that. I would also say that treatment options generally in most parts of the world uh, are becoming more accessible. Uh, but, but there is a long way to go to make uh, psychiatric treatment uh, something that everyone who needs it gets. Um, now then, what's the problem? Well, I think the, the one issue here is 
that symptom levels don't decrease over time. Uh, also, it doesn't seem to help to be a very rich country compared to a poorer country. Um, of course, there are many other positive uh, things uh, health-wise uh, in Sweden, but here um, it doesn't seem to be the obvious solution to the problem. There is also somewhat of a paradox when it comes to treatment on the population level, because we, we treat more and more people with depression, as an example, but depression does not seem to become less prevalent. So expanding to treatment, which we should do for many, there are many good reasons to that, may also not solve uh, this uh, issue. Another issue that, that is very complicated, and I think it becomes a issue mostly when uh, prevalent rates go up, prevalence rates go up. So for many psychiatric disorders, there is huge underdiagnosis in all countries. Uh, but for some uh, disorders, they actually have become very prevalent. So at least in, in Sweden, and I think in the US also, for instance, ADHD and autism has, has gone in a few decades from a very from very unusual diagnosis to very common ones in Sweden, certainly more common than you would expect from, from prevalence studies. So then the, the, the unclear boundaries of psychiatric diagnosis become more of an issue for society. And these boundaries, I, I guess, will always remain um, a bit un unclear because that's how the diagnoses are constructed. It's, there is not, um, they are uh, sensitive to, to context. Um, I think one, one uh, the best illustration of this, um, uh, of this phenomenon that psychiatric diagnosis or symptoms like the symptoms of depression, they overlap heavily with, with non-pathological uh, phenomenon as well. And I think Amy Silverberg in this tweet nailed this quite nicely. So it could be an anxiety disorder, but it could also just be the person you are married to. So uh, I, I think most people would agree that um, not all human suffering should be interpreted as, as a psychiatric diagnosis. And in this illustration, the, the larger circle is just suffering. And the inner circle is the suffering that we uh, classify as psychiatric, a psychiatric diagnosis. So not, not everything should be classified as it, but certainly also not nothing. So where how much of suffering that should be um, classified as psychiatric diagnosis is up to us. Uh, and I, I, I want to acknowledge that I understand that this may be a non-issue in many countries where it's very hard to get the psychiatric diagnosis and treatment. So it's mostly an issue in countries that where a greater po uh, part of the population are diagnosed. And, and the, one of the problems is, of course, that psychiatric phenotypes or symptoms or problems are almost always a variation. If you take social anxiety or um, um, depressed mood or attention or anything like that, there will be a variation and you somewhere you have to dichotomize it to make a diagnosis. And where you do that will affect how many get the diagnosis and not. And that's just the way it is. It's not much you can do about it, but it's also, I think, important for us in the medical field to acknowledge that diagnoses aren't as precise as we like to think that they are. And I, I guess one qu question that fascinates me is how psychiatry and psychology has become the go-to solution for human suffering in some countries of the world. I, I say again, not, not, not to seem too ignorant of the world outside of Sweden. Um, 
Well, I think one, one reason for that is that it seems to work for people. Uh, while we as psychiatrists rarely feel, feel popular, uh, maybe that's why we ended up in psychiatry in the first place, but uh, clearly uh, psychiatric diagnosis and treatment is something very popular and seems has meaning to people. Um, and, but I also think that other uh, systems of understanding su suffering in some countries have just uh, lost um, popularity or whatever you would say. So for instance, in, in most people in the world believe in an almighty God. And if God is almighty, you actually have an explanation for suffering and the context for suffering. It may not be, you know, fully explain your individual problems, but certainly there is a lot of emphasis on suffering in most religions. Another, I think, system to make uh, for understanding suffering is a political uh, understanding. And in Sweden, for instance, we had a, a social democratic movement for about 100 years. And, and in, 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 the, in this um, context, understanding why people suffer and try to remove injustice and other things that cause the suffering is a way of both understanding suffering and removing suffering. And I, I, my thinking is that uh, most of these collective explanations of suffering uh, have lost importance in, for instance, Sweden, and we resort to individual explanations of suffering. And, the, and that's where a medical diagnosis fits like a glove. Uh, one worry that I have is that it may lead to a, a more medical view of suffering, may lead to a, to a, uh, to, may, to, to a view where suffering isn't normal anymore. It's seen as something we should be able to extinguish or just make go away to an extent that may become problematic. And I use the term neurotic threadmill here, and, and I, it, it's probably not a very common term. I, I took it from a dissertation that's, that was published at the Department of Psychology at Harvard just recently by someone, by uh, Peyton Jones. It's a very interesting concept and a very interesting dissertation. And the, the idea is that if adversity decreases in society, which is something I think we all would think is a good thing, then people become more, more vulnerable, meaning that there will be a kind of a thread mill you, you, you get stuck in here. So, uh, and, and Sweden is probably one of the countries with, with the lowest societal adversity for people in general. Of course, there are exceptions to that, but in general, it's a safe place, a rich place, et cetera. So, in line with this idea, then, at the richer spectrum of the world, um, where violence is going down and other things, adver uh, adverse things are going down, we may then have the issue that, for instance, the, the, the concepts of psychopathology are expanding. So trauma may... Uh, and, and that this is something that Peyton Jones uh, examines in his thesis here is that uh, if, if you take typical uh, descriptions of trauma, people uh, who live in a safer place tend to describe more things as trauma. So there is a bracket creep, an expansion of, of the psychiatric concept in a safer context. Uh, so in some way, it may be that, for instance, in Sweden, that we, we, we should prepare for that mental health problems uh, will not be solved by just getting richer and richer and putting more and more money into the, the, the different uh, projects uh, surrounding this. Um, 
So uh, I'm, I'm sorry to, to uh, uh, if that sounded a bit pessimistic, but I, I think it, it's good to be to prepare for a situation in the best possible way. So what can we do then? So I think, of course, we, we can do a lot by just providing treatment to people with mental health problem. And there is certainly a lot more to be done there. Uh, we know that in many disorders, a minority of people get the the, the, the treatments that they should get, e even in, in the countries in the world that have the most resources. I think one other thing is to, in, in countries where the prevalence rates are high, like in Sweden, for instance, I think it's also important to understand both the benefits and the limitations of the medical model as an explanation for human suffering and for, for the creation of meaning to individuals. Uh, and I think the we should probably or we should uh, realize the mental health problems are here to stay and they will probably become a bigger share of health problems over time as many other health problems. Uh, there we have solutions that make them less prevalent. So I, I'm, I, I would foresee that mental health problems will become a bigger and bigger problem for society. And, and I, I would say in Sweden, it's, it's our biggest health uh, um, challenge that, that we have ahead of us. Uh, and, and, and I know in, in this session, we, we will hear from Dr. Shibanda here about the bench project. And I think there are... Uh, the realization that the medical model uh, has limitations to me also says that we should learn from others. Uh, we should also learn from from uh, what, what solution can be that we can use that do not come from from the medical sector or the psychiatric sector. So that was all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we, have, we do have a few questions for you. Um, some clarifications about the statement on suicide. Uh, what accounts for the reduction in suicide? And also, um, can we say that suicide rate is going down globally or was that in Sweden? Well, I think the notable exception is the United the US. Uh, globally, we can say that. Uh, um, and I mean, over over a longer period of time, it's it's a substantial decrease. And I think one of the reasons is that the the means, uh, you know, the ways that you can die by suicide uh, have been re reduced in in many countries. It, it's it's harder to do it uh, because, well, for instance, in uh, you know farm chemicals that that were used a lot in some countries have been. Uh, harder to come by, for instance. So that's th that is a positive global trend. I, I... Hmm. Good, thank you. Uh, please stay on, and we will have uh, a panel discussion uh, later on after hearing the two more speakers. So, uh, just one more question, then, Christian. Will your book come out in English soon? Uh, not that I know of, <laughs> but maybe being on the Uppsala Health Summit will change things. Perhaps. <laughs> I think that should be a good thing. Uh, 